G'day guys and welcome, my name's Michael and I am the Dead Aussie Gamer, here to share with you my tips, tricks, ideas and strategies for playing and running tabletop role-playing games. Today's video, getting the dice rolling. Now, whether or not you are a old-time gamer who has been playing for many years, or a brand new person to the hobby, trying to get a table started can often be something that we think is super simple. Get people together, start playing, right? Well. While that can absolutely work for people, I have a particular method that I follow every time I put together a game. I feel like it helps me focus, I guess. Especially because I run so many games, it's important for me to make sure that I don't shirk on any of my duties as a game master while I'm preparing games. And this, this simple process, before I even start a game, can actually really help me when I'm uh, getting, into, getting into the mood, getting into the excitement of role playing. So, the first thing I do, no matter what game I've been asked to do, is I get excited. I find something that really just speaks to me, and something that gets me very, um, very enthusiastic about the game I'm about to run. This could be the game system itself, maybe we're playing a new edition of a very famous game that I actually really, really like and haven't had a chance to play yet. Um, or maybe we have found a particular character that everyone likes and they want to do like kind of a follow-up story based on that character that I now get to portray. Maybe I'm simply excited because the people are so incredible and awesome and I can't wait to, to roleplay with these awesome people. Whatever it is, finding that sense of excitement can really make a huge difference in a campaign. Uh, I often find that burnout, especially as a role player, happens all the time. And that first step, just simply stopping and acknowledging, hey, what is getting me excited about this game? And, or if not, what can I get excited about this game, can just make all that difference to help resist that burnout, if you ever come across it. But then again, I imagine most of you guys aren't playing stupid amounts of games a week, like me. So that step one is, is optional. But I recommend it. It's fun. It's good to feel good. Uh, step two, story and genre. Now, a lot of people kind of differ on opinions on this. Some people say, hey, get your players together and then as a group decide the story and the genre. That's perfectly fine. Very admirable. I appreciate that. But for me, I think the only thing a GM has the right to be selfish about is the story, you know? It's the, it, 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 it's a collaborative storytelling experience, sure, but if you get excited about the idea of telling a story that is set in the genre of the spaghetti western, you know, then that's what you should be running. And your players should be either embracing that and coming along for the awesome journey that you are going to go on, or they should, you know, maybe suggest things that'll work with you, you know? I had a scenario uh, a long time ago where I had a group of players uh, who were going to, from one game to another, and I asked them outrightly, hey guys, what do you want me to run? Uh, this was a younger Michael and one who just didn't have time to sort of prep too many games, and uh, the, the end result that came back to me is, uh, we want to play a sci-fi fantasy adventure, we want to play with like fantasy characters that have like science fiction going on, and that that's kind of what we want to do, because that's really exciting. And I went, okay, cool, fantastic. Um, you know what? Pathfinder just released uh, the Iron Gods Adventure Path. I've been really keen on trying it out because uh, there's a whole bunch of new supplement books that came out around the time. Uh, let's play that. And they're like, oh, okay, well, well what does that do? What, is the, what does it start with? And it's like, okay, cool, you're in this small town of Torch. Uh, you're going on a quest to go and find some missing people. And that's what you've got to do. Oh, okay, okay, cool. I said, fantastic, let's do this. I got the group together, set up the table, and they began the adventure in the town of Torch. Immediately following, each player came up with a story that involved them leaving the nation and going on a quest for treasure. Um, and I'm not talking about like trying to find reward or payment. I mean like literally like to go treasure hunting. And I went, um, hey guys, what are you doing? You, you said that you wanted to play this game and, and none of you are interested in this? It's like, here is literally the quest giver saying, Oh, please, sir, will you go and help us find these missing people? And they've turned around and gone, uh, No, sir, um, we have business elsewhere. We need to go and find treasure because we require it, because we are treasure hunters, and that's what we've built. And I was very angry. Uh, actually, you know what? I was, I was a little angry. My girlfriend, who is the one who taught me how to roleplay, I shared this story with her. Oh, she was fuming. She was so angry. She started the sentence, which ranted at me, by the way. She didn't tell this to the players. She yelled at me with, how 
dare they? And I was like, you know, it's, it's a whole thing. So while I understand the, the process behind allowing the players to determine what story everyone plays, I think it's the only it's the only scope a GM, I feel, has the right to be selfish about. If you want to run something, run it, you know? Get your players on board after that and get them kind of all flowing in the same kind of way. So it's like, yeah, cool, we're playing a Spaghetti Western. Oh, I don't really like Spaghetti Western. It's like, okay, cool, well, what kind of things do you like? Oh, I like adventure stuff. All right, well, what if we mix a little bit of the Spaghetti Western in with some of the fantasy stuff? So, you know, rather than riding horses, you're riding giant ostriches that uh, have lizard heads. You know, playing around with it means that you can kind of find a nice medium if you want to play with those players, you know. Which then brings me to the third step, players. Deciding who should be on your table. Now, the simple truth is, is you should be playing with people that you get along with, right? But sometimes you play with people who are simply part of a role-playing friends group. Or maybe you're playing in public. Or maybe you're playing with uh, some brand new people at an adventurer's league or Pathfinder Society sort of deal. Whatever the case is, as a GM, when you put your players together, you need to kind of bear in mind that everyone's got their own expectations, everyone's got their own requirements and desires, and to be understanding of it. But at the end of the day, you are the one who determines who stays and who leaves at any given point. Find people that complement your gaming style. If you're like me, a very character-based uh, role player, then you don't do well with murder hobos. If you're someone who, well then again, very few people do get well with murder hobos, but that's a separate issue. Uh, if you are someone who actually really just loves the idea of the mechanics of a game and actually getting into the system itself, then a group of power builders may really complement what you're doing. All of these things and more are things to take into account. Now, if it gets to a point where players sort of become antsy or complacent about a story, don't stress out. I often find that players will stress their opinions towards a story, but inevitably are willing to give it a crack. Mostly because very few are willing to take up the DM mantle themselves. I mean, I've, I've presented the point before. I've said, hey guys, look, I want to do a horror game because it is October. October Horror Month! Which, by the way, yes, I am doing an October Horror Month. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had people go, oh, you know, I don't really do horror. And then I'm like, okay, well, the next game's horror, so if you're not going to take the seat, that's fine, thank you so much. Uh, I'll let you know when the next game's up. And then you go, oh, you know what? Uh, yeah, actually, you know, I will stay. I will stay behind. Because there's that fear. It's the fear that they're going to lose their seat, that they're not going to be able to socialize, you know. And you'll find that players will be willing to give some leeway if you're kind of at least apparently willing to leave the seat open for them or other people who would appreciate the game. Uh, so, yeah, choosing your players. Very important. Um, now... The next step kind of leans into the players because there are many different types of ways we can role play. We can role play in person, we can role play online, we can role play in a text to, you know, that whole play by post. That's the word I'm looking for. We can t uh, play, do play by post role playing. Whatever it is, you need to decide what platform best suits your players, your story, and the excitement you're building. Are you excited about building maps? Fantastic, that's awesome. Uh, do you have a series of maps and programs that you use to help build up and shape your world? Is it a campaign you've been preparing for for ages and you've used programs like World Anvil and Dungeon Fog to make an amazing array of things for your campaign? Then fantastic. Deciding this platform is always going to shape how the game works because it is going to feed directly into your prep time. Uh, in my perspective, when I decide a table and I get to this stage, I'm like, cool, I've got my players together, I've got my story in mind, how do I run this game? Cool, I don't really have much time, let's go with Theatre of the Mind. Theatre of the Mind is fantastic because it's a platform that can happen anywhere. It's a vocal platform uh, or even a text-based platform where all you do is take that little extra time to describe the world. Pretend you're in a podcast. Always say, yes, you walk in, you knock on the door three times, and as you do, you hear a voice speaking from within with a dry and gravelly tone. Enter. You know, these things shape and create that sense of space and wonderment, and Theatre of the Mind is fantastic for that. It also requires no map making, no miniatures, and for the most part, you can use digital dice if you really wanted to. The second level is like the in-person stuff, you know, drawing your own maps, custom on the fly, uh, or having miniatures and stuff like that. 
Things like Roll20 are great, Fantasy Grounds. Um, hell, I've even done it using just Zoom, which is the video software that I use to, to do a whole bunch of my shows. Uh, and I do it sometimes with people in my neighborhood, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, like people who um, like live just down the road. I might not be able to game with them because, well, they're married and they have to actually stay home with the kids. But they've got a small office so they can uh, Zoom chat in. And in, while I'm drawing maps on the board, I can draw maps on the program. And, you know, it's a free form, free hand type thing, which is great and fantastic. It's easy to improv. It's something visual. But I always say that, you know, always always do that kind of game with people in person. You know, I, I find that that's, that's the best way to go about it. When you step into the digital world, when you step into the online spectrum and you really have the time to to pull apart and really sort of get into a game, which I feel is most people who don't run tons and tons of games, um, one, always keep your organization skills on point. Always take notes, always keep a journal or a diary of the events as they unfold, and um, you know, use whatever techniques or tricks you have to maintain and create your master plot and your adventure as it goes through. Uh, again, World Anvil, fantastic program for that. Uh, also, Guy from How to Be a Great Game Master released a, uh, a book on creating campaigns as well. Uh, I'll put some links in the description below. Go check those out if you want to use that platform. Um, but another way you can do that is through a pr program called Fantasy Grounds. Uh, where you can upload um, like maps and stuff like that. You can upload character sheets and you can have a lot of stuff automatically generated. It turns tabletop into an almost virtual tabletop. This is what I call like the kind of advanced game. I really only reserve this sort of game to like the ones that I want to run for a very short period of time, but I want to run a very high quality game. So platform, very important because uh, again, judging your time commitment. Next up is your system. Once you've decided the story, how many players and what players you're going to have, and what type of GMing style you're going to be using, choosing a game can be very tricky. What is going to complement your story? If you're playing in a cowboy western setting, maybe Deadlands is going to be a great game for you. If you're playing in a Marvel-inspired superhero adventure, then Mutants and Masterminds would be fantastic. What if you're playing a reenactment of the movie It? Kids on Bikes is perfect. Finding the right system for the right game can sometimes be exactly the difference between trying to squeeze in Dungeons and Dragons into something that just doesn't really reflect the story you're making or trying to make something that, you know, you're all kind of getting into. And if you're worried about being a GM who doesn't know how to use a system or, you know, these are kind of unfamiliar waters you're treading, don't worry. Because if you're learning these rules anew, then chances are your players are as well. Learn together. It's part of the bonding process. So don't be afraid to mix up the system to find something that's going to be suitable for you guys and your particular game. All right, the last thing, last thing, absolutely last thing, is time. Time is so important. And as you, no, actually, you know what, forget it. Not as you grow up. Every single point, every person, doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or you're 50, Time is always going to be against you when you role play. Uh, schools, you know, you've got exams. And whenever exams crop in, you see people disappear. When people get new girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever partners they prefer, uh, again, they disappear. They vanish. And it happens. Uh, you know, you've got wife. You've got kids. You've got the dogs. You've got the mortgage. You've got all these other things in life that take you away from role playing. Uh, and it's fine. What you need to do is remember that scheduling changes, scheduling shift, you know, and campaigns run for a long time. You can have one-shot games, sure. You can have games that run for years. I, for one, uh, am running games out of my local youth center for, I think, like the last game we ran was Rise of the Rune Lords, and it lasted three years. Three years! Think of that. I played a campaign for three years with over 20 people, and it was, it was insane, right? So remember that. You can't expect people in that length of time to keep everything rigid and firm. I highly recommend when you decide the timing, give yourself a period of time. Like say, okay, cool guys, look, the first portion of the adventure, let's go for six months, see how it goes. Or maybe even three months. If you guys can keep making the time, we'll do it again for another three months. And then again for another three months, so on and so forth. Breaking it down in this way is going to make it much easier to deal with scheduling. Number two, be willing to change the day. If 
uh, you find that people are like, oh, you know what? The babysitter canceled on me. I, I can't do tonight. Sure. Maybe you could Skype in. Or maybe uh, we'll keep you up to date with a text by text type thing. So you're almost playing, you know, play by post while everyone's playing at the table. There are many things that you can do as workarounds to help people with time. But you need to get to that habit where A, if you cannot make a time to communicate it, B, if you need the time altered, again, bring it up, communicate it. And C, don't overstretch yourself for the duration of the game. This is a common mistake. A lot of players I've spoken to have said, oh, well, we play a six to seven hour game. It's very impressive, don't get me wrong. But a six to seven hour game for me, it just doesn't sound fun. It sounds like something that is me pushing myself um, beyond a certain point where I'd be comfortable. For me, the greatest time is like anywhere between three to five hours, right? Four is kind of the gold number. Three is solid. You know, I'm very happy with three hours. And five hours is kind of on that cusp of being too long. Two hour games, sure. Maybe a one shot game or a demo game. That'd be kind of cool. Or in the case of Twitch, you know, if you're creating a show for an audience, two hours is the max I would go because, you know, attention spans. Um, whereas, you know, six hours is just, whoa, it's just, just, uh, by the time it's six hours, it's like, okay, cool, guys, I need a break, I need to go eat, I need to go to the bathroom, I need to just unwind and bring myself back to reality, and then I can come back and play again. So, yeah, it's much easier to find three hours a week than it is to find six or seven hours a week. It's basic, you know, the way it works. But what that means is that if you are doing the shorter type games, you need to make sure that your players that you choose are ones that understand that. Don't get distracted. Don't spend your time like catching up on the, uh, the, the events of the week two hours into the game that's only going to last three hours, you know? Take the time to sort of maybe meet a little bit earlier, you know? Show up. Just be like, hey, what's up? You know, let's, you know, catch up. Let's share. But then when that clock hits, if you're running a short game, go into it. Straight into it and just say, yep, that's it. We're beginning. Uh, this and many more are just some easy ways that you can manage your time better and, you know, make sure that everyone is going to be able to sit, enjoy, and embrace the wonderful role-playing game that you have now created. Um, so, thank you so much guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed this video. Tell me about what gets you excited for role-playing games in the chat below, and I would love to hear from you guys. So, yeah, leave a message, let us know. I'll have a whole bunch of links in the description below, so be sure to check those out. Uh, and of course, if you want to support us on Patreon, head on over to our Patreon page, where as for as little as a dollar a month, you can keep me alive. Yep, that's it, a dollar alive. That's because I eat dollar coins. All right, thank you so much, guys. Until next time, as always, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and game hard, or die trying. Bye!